My name is Carissa Miller. I'm the Program and Communications Specialist for Montgomery County Medical Society. Thank you for joining us for this Q&A on the Montgomery County Primary Care and Dental Grant Program. The grant program was created by the Montgomery County Council Appropriation of CARES Act funds. This grant program is meant to provide relief to independent primary care medical and general dentistry practices based in Montgomery County in response to lost revenue and costs related to reopening practices during the COVID-19 public health state of emergency. The program is accepting applications now through November 29th. We are fortunate today to be joined by a program staff member who can answer questions pertaining to the grant program eligibility, application requirements, and preference methodology. We are joined today by Susan Donovan, MHA, who is the Managing Director of Nexus Montgomery and the Primary Care Coalition. We're helping to administrate the program for the county. So we'll go ahead and start the Q&A now, since I know we have limited time today. Just a few reminders as we begin. We have muted participants at the beginning of the call for sound quality purposes. To mute or unmute yourself over the phone, you can press star six. On PC, that's Alt A, and on Mac, that's Shift Command A, or you can hit the uh, microphone button on the bottom left hand of your screen. Um, the purpose of this call is to answer your questions. So uh, please go ahead and start submitting your questions in the chat box or unmute yourself. Um, and just for now, as those are sort of queuing up, I'm going to ask our three most frequently asked questions of our presenter that we've received since the program launched. So the first one that we've gotten a lot from folks is the question, is a practice eligible to apply if it has previously received financial support through another COVID-19 assistance program, like the Paycheck Protection Program? And Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the answer to that question is yes, um, practices are still eligible. Um, we ask that um, practices report any um, assistance through those programs um, when they're reporting their 2020 revenue numbers. Um, that's part of the grant application. Um, so a practice will still need to demonstrate um, a financial um, impact of COVID uh, with those numbers included, but they are not themselves a direct exclusion criteria for the program. Okay. Um, what defines a primary care provider and can a multi-specialty practice apply? Yes, so um, a primary care provider, um, uh, we have a um, uh, detailed definition in the reporting portal um, but I will um, read to you, I think, some of the main takeaways um, that um, we are defining it as someone who is primarily responsible for the overall health care needs of a patient and who coordinates ongoing care um, with um, additional practitioners, um, including referrals to specialists. Um, we would expect that that would include um, um, physicians and, and um, providers with the following specialties, general medicine, family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, geriatrics, um, obstetrics, gynecology, and preventative medicine. Um, and then multi-specialty practices, um, to answer that component of the question, um, multi-specialty multi practices are eligible um, with um, the requirement that 75% of the practice providers um, uh, meet the primary care provider definition. So um, if 75% of a practice's providers are primary care, then they are eligible to apply. Um, if uh, less than that amount is primary care, they would not be eligible. And uh, what sort of documentation would a practice need to um, provide upon application to substantiate that? For the primary care component of that? Yes. Um, there, we are not requiring any documentation um, of the specialty information. Um, we will be independently verifying that information um, through publicly available information, um, but there's no additional um, su supporting documentation required for the specialty information. Okay, great. Um, so what is the definition of an independent practice for the program's purposes? Yes. Um, so. Um, an independent practice um, in, in general will, will mean a practice that the a group of providers 
um, either physicians or dentists or other providers um, own a majority, so greater than 50% um, of the practice and retain key operating um, and management oversight of the practice. Um, so in general, um, that would mean, you know, groups that are um, part of a ACOs, um, CINs, the Maryland Primary Care Program, um, those types of programs where you can remain independent, um, uh, th those would be eligible to apply if you're participating in those types of programs. Um, if you are um, significantly partnered with um, are financially supported by large commercial organizations um, or large anchor institutions um, or um, participate with um, a management service organization, those practices would not be um, considered independent for the purposes of this award. Okay, great. Um, and then the, the fourth most frequently asked question we have is, um, what if a practice has practice locations both inside and outside of Montgomery County? Can they still apply? They can apply, yes. Um, we, the intention is to provide support for their Montgomery County practices only. Um, and in the financial section where you will submit um, numbers and, and support, backup support um, um, for that financial information, you'll have two options if you have locations inside and outside of Montgomery County. The first option, the preferred option, is that um, if you have that documentation available for Montgomery County based practices only, that we would ask that you upload it for those, lo those locations only. If that's not available, um, depending on what um, type of financial reporting and um, of, um, data that's available, uh, if you only are able to report for all of your practices, um, including practices outside of Montgomery County, um, we ask for um, physician provider uh, full-time equivalent information for Montgomery County-based offices relative to all office locations. And then the amount that you are eligible for from the grant program will be prorated by the Montgomery County-based FTEs. Okay. Um, so I see um, Dr. Gonti has a question. Would you like to unmute yourself to ask that? Okay, we can come back around. Um, so another question we've had is, what if an EMR software does not have the reporting capability on the percent of the practice's patient population that belongs to groups identified as disproportionately impacted by COVID, so polling by zip code, um, or with healthcare access challenges? So uh, you will ha would have the option to um, submit the results of a 30 patient chart audit um, as a secondary um, form of documentation. The, the preferred option, which is noted in the application, is that EMR reporting. But if that is not available, we will accept um, a, a random 40 patient or 30 patient chart audits um, and, and the results of that. So if a practice does not have an EMR in place, would they also be able to use that method upon application? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, how did the county select the zip codes most impacted by COVID-19? That is uh, based on the COVID incidence data. Um, and so those are, these are the top 10 um, most uh, zip codes with the most cases of COVID in the county. Okay. Um, do applicants have to provide banking information on the application? They do. Um, that would be provided um, upon application and then that is what is utilized in, in the case that the grant is awarded. Okay. Uh, Dr. Saba, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I'm a little conf So I do. So the PL report that we need to upload. So, like, I had, I've gotten the loan from the state of Maryland. So that is in a separate account. It goes into my month as I need it. How do I show? I mean, it's still come out to a negative. I'm like, how do I, it's part of my revenue, but it ends up being a negative with my expenses. 
Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Like, yes. So, and it's not, not reflected in your current reporting. Is that right, what so, I mean, the issue yeah. is? Yeah. I mean, I don't put it in as a revenue because it's a loan. I'm taking from it. I'm paying my expenses. You know, the profit, the revenue is what I'm receiving for the patients I've been seeing. So say I get, you know, 5,000, but then I had to pull from the Maryland loan program another 10,000 to pay expenses. So now I've got a negative, you know, margin. Um, so it, it's really not revenue, it's a loan. So I, I'm a little confused as to how I'm supposed to show that. So, and if, if it is in, so I, 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 I'm not sure about the specifics of that program um, itself. Um, so I mean, would, I use I, QuickBooks, it's a P and L. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, it's really I, not revenue. It's a loan. I'm going to have to end up paying that back in the other years based on revenue that's coming in. So, I mean, and the other part of the application I, I put down that I got Maryland loan, I put down that I got the SBA loan, um, you know, which I'm trying not to utilize so I have as much to pay back. Um, yeah, I will, I would say that um, the, the requirement of including the previously received assistance um, as revenue, um, the, the, I think the intention is to capture um, those things that are pure revenue and that are not, you know, loans that are to be paid back. Um, okay. But can you, can you also send that question to the grant inbox? Um, I will. And, and we can confirm that for you. Yeah, because it's really confusing, even as you start, you so said whatever you've got needs to be included as your revenue, but <laughs> sure, but not, yeah, it's not patient. Yeah, I think not the, revenue in that sense, right? Sure, yeah, um, the, 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 the clear cases would obviously be assistance programs where you're getting other grants or thing, things of that nature. Um, right. But we will, um, if you okay. can send that into the inbox, we'll, we'll confirm the, the, um, need for those types of loan programs. I will, I will. And I'm sorry, I have a couple more. Can I keep going or is there someone else that needs to ask a question? You can keep going. Okay. Um, when it says um, the volume of patients in your practice, is there a time frame you want that from or just your volume period? I mean, I've been in practice for a while. People come and go like, what? So the, and are you referring to the, the summary for that or is there a specific application portal question? I don't have it right in front of me right now. I thought I'd screenshot it before I came to the office, but no, I didn't, okay. it was one of the questions. It just said volume of patient. And then it said, it also asked like the 50% mark, like how do I determine that 50% mark? Cause like in PEDS right now, I mean, it varies by month. It's a little bit of a different thing. Like you know, my, sure. the number of patients I'm going to be seeing the next couple of months are going to go down because the kids aren't in school and they're not going to be sick and they're really not getting their physical. So it's going to be less. It's just not showing yet. So didn't know, is there a place to then answer that? I mean, I'm a little frustrated with the application, to be perfectly honest, because you can't move forward till you filled other stuff out. And I'm like trying to gather everything all together. I work a little different, mm. get all my stuff together and put it in. So that's a little, that's been a little bit difficult and thank you for everything you're doing, but that's been a little tough. <laughs> well, we will take that, take that feedback um, for the, the portal developers. Um, I would, I would say, and I, I know um, this may not be directly your question, but I, I want to just address it because we've gotten it um, from a couple of people. Um, there's a, there's a section where we're, we ask for kept patient visits. Um, so yeah. I'm not sure if that's a piece of the question. And, and by that we, we mean, um, you know, visits where people have showed and Shown um, have have arrived for as opposed to scheduled visits. Okay. Um, and so the the question about returning to 50% capacity, um, we would expect would also be based on kept visits. Um, and I think we we would um, if you got back to that point, I think at any point is when we are interested in that recognizing that it may fluctuate. Um, and you can feel free to um, include um, any additional information in some of the narrative sections if it is okay. um, fluctuating significantly. Great, great, thanks. Thank you.
Yep. That's it. Thanks for your That's questions. Good. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, this is Ilona, and I'm, I'm asking a question on behalf of Dr. Ganti. Um, I know, Susan, that you did say so briefly about capped patients. So that was my question. Can you elaborate on what capped patients mean? So just, I, so the intention would be that a visit that um, uh, an individual showed up um, and actually had the visit. So does that include um, telemedicine, telecon, uh, telecon? Yes, it would, would include telemedicine. Okay, and um, exclude the canceled and no shows? Correct. Okay, all right. So that any, any patient who received the services in any, via, via any media like so, correct? Yes, I mean, yes. Yes. Okay. Any cap. Any any patient receive services via uh, an appointment or a visit. Yes. Okay. Whether Sorry. it was telehealth or in person. Sure. Sure. And telephone consults also, right? You said. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, to follow up on that, would kept patients also include um, patients who came through for specifically for a flu vaccine during that period and for nothing else? That is a good question. Um, I may have to take that back to the team and um, and confirm that. I would say um, that that may vary depending on um, how you all are tracking those appointments. Um, so my my suggestion at this time would be if if that if you are doing those as nursing visits or um, that type of um, setup, then you should go ahead and include those. Um, and I will, I'll confirm with the team if there's additional information that, that we would want to provide there. All right, thank you. Um, Dr. Saba, would you like yeah, to? Yeah, so thanks. So the question where it asks your percentage of African-American or Latino, what time frame are we looking at to give that percentage? Because that also fluctuates. Sure, um, I would I would recommend a year, um, but we didn't want to be too prescriptive in case folks had um, differing time ranges that were available in their systems. Um, but the the past year um, um, of patients would would be I think what we would recommend. Okay, so kind of like October to October time frame. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Sorry, Dr. Hamani. I had to um, mute you. Feel free to ask questions in the chat box or unmute yourself. Um, so the next question we have is, what is the maximum grant amount a practice is eligible for? So um, the maximum that any one practice will be eligible to receive is $60,000. Um, and so that, and that is an up to amount based on um, the financial data that will be reported. So other types of aid that a practice has received will, um, will change the total amount they're eligible for? Correct, yes. Okay. Um, when will practices find out if they're getting a grant? So the, the latest that um, practices will find out and be notified is um, December 30th, um, and, but we would expect to begin um, providing notices um, sometime in, in mid-December through the end of the year. Okay, and will there be additional documentation that will be required of practices at that time? There, we do not anticipate that at this time. Um, while we are going through the application review, review process, um, we may reach out to folks if we have questions or um, what they've submitted. Uh, we may request additional documentation, um, but that would only be on an as needed basis. And then once the award is made, um, there are some attestations that um, practices um, are required to sign off on in, in part of the process of submitting the application, um, but there we would not at, at this time are not anticipating any further 
um, follow up uh, documentation uh, after the award is made either. Okay. Um, will attestations be available for eSign? Uh, the the submitting of the application and the signing of the application submittal it, it serves as the the signature on those attestations. Okay. Um, what date does the program define as the beginning of the pandemic? So uh, I believe that is March thirteenth, um, but let me confirm. Um, yes, Friday, March thirteenth is the the start date. Okay. Um, and who can applicants contact if they have additional questions? So they can um, reach out to grants at primarycarecoalition.org. Um, and we should uh, typically, um, should you should typically get a response within the business day. Um, and we will be checking that um, that email, uh, on, we will not be checking it on Thursday of this week for, for the holiday, but we'll be checking it um, on Friday and through the weekend up until 5 p.m. on Sunday. Okay, and uh, what is the final day and time that people can submit their application? So November 29th um, at 11.59 p.m. Um, is the final deadline. Okay. Great. Well, that runs through the frequently asked questions that we have listed here. Do we have other questions from um, call participants? Hi, this is Susan D'Antoni. I have a question for you. Um, so I'm curious, um, once you have vetted the application, and you have determined that this application has met all the requirements and is approved. Um, will you then base awards on when you receive the application or what other criteria might you use to determine the awards? Because you so, only have an established amount of money. Correct, so the prioritization will be based on the patient population that's served, um, so the, the for those that have started the application, um, I think, I believe it's section four, um, where you provide information about the percent of patients that live in the 10 zip codes, the percent of patients that are African-American Hispanic. There's a number of other criteria um, that um, uh, I try to identify patient populations disproportionately impacted by COVID. Um, so folks will provide that information um, and then there will be a scoring and a prioritization um, based on uh, applicants' response to those questions. Um, and so we will um, prioritize those that score higher in that section for award. Thank you, I appreciate that. And, and you address this to a, a particular uh, extent, but you know there are lots of specialists, uh, if you will, that do a tremendous amount of primary care in their practices. Uh, whether that's cardiologists, rheumatology, others. Um, so could you just um, respond to maybe some of those that might be on our call this evening about um, how those will be ranked in terms of maybe the percentage or the location of those patients that they're providing primary care to? So um, the, currently the definition of primary care would exclude those practices that are um, those types that you describe, a cardiology, rheumatology. Um, so those, those groups would not be eligible for this program. Um, and is, would there be any reconsideration of that? Because I know a number of patients who cease to go to internists because I mean, cardiologists, for instance, are internal medicine and cardiology board certified. So they cease to go to internal medicine or family practice and only go to say a cardiologist or depending upon the level of their, you know, their medical issues. Um, you know, so we, we know that it's a fact that a lot of primary care is being provided in the county by those physicians. So, um, so the determination's already been made and so there's no value in their submitting an application. 
I, correct. I, I would say that if, if you know, uh, um, kind of out of my uh, particular hands um, on that determination, but if um, folks are concerned about that or if they have any questions, um, again, I would direct them to the email inbox and we can um, send that along um, for anyone that might um, want to share their thoughts in that space. I have a question, Dr. Scherer. Uh, so I would be in that category that Susan just described, possibly. I do internal medicine and also hematology, oncology, but I do much more general internal medicine these days. So would I be excluded because I also am listed as a, a hemonc? Or do you need a percentage of the patients I see in each category? Do you mind um, sending kind of a, a, a short that short description to the grant inbox, and I can pass that along to the team to consider? Okay. Also, I guess you want a percent. I haven't even looked at the application yet, but you need a percentage of African American Latino patients and a percentage of patients in certain zip codes. I don't know if I can retrieve that from our our records. That's yep. So tedious to do. I think. Yeah, um, so in the, we, we're retrieving it from the, even the chart audit version. So the, the, two, the two options for those um, to, to reiterate were, would be the, the reporting from the EMR, which is the preferred option, um, but we do uh, offer the backup option of, of a 30 patient, random patient chart audit to provide that information. Um, and there, there also is a, a do not know option if that's really not even anything that's documented in any kind of way in the EMR, um, you can still submit um, uh, for some of the other um, categories, um, even if you don't have all of them. Uh, so I have an, an anonymously submitted question. This practice hasn't started their application yet. They're trying to get all of their documentation together. Um, they're wondering if you're willing to sort of describe the different sections of the application and go back over, you know, the different pieces of documentation that they'll need to have on hand as they go through that process. Sure. Um, without having it in front of me, I will do my best. Um, so the first section is a, an eligibility screen. So it will go through the very basics of primary care, independent, located in Montgomery County, um, good standing with the state of Maryland um, for those practices that aren't sole proprietorships, um, and then um, practice providers, good standing with the, the state licensing boards. Um, after that um, eligibility determination, there is a financial section that um, asks for financial um, p for 2019 and then 2020 through the end of, of Q3. Um, and that is uh, revenue, expenses, kept patient visits for those time periods, and then um, backup documentation support of that information. Um, so for 2019, um, we're accepting your, um, whatever your federal um, IRS um, tax profit and loss um, forms are. Um, and then for 2020 um, would accept um, any of your, you know, um, practice operating um, practice financial management system um, reporting for that documentation. Um, then continuing the financial section, there are some other questions about um, any significant um, non-COVID financial impact on um, how your practice has responded to COVID, um, any unreimbursed COVID-related expenses, um, and so some, some other questions along those lines. Um, that information will be used to determine the grant amount that you would be eligible to for up to $60,000. Um, then, then, then the application gets into um, those um, patient population questions for prioritization. Um, and so we ask for the backup documentation that we've discussed of um, reporting out of your EMR or practice operating software um, as, a, as a preferred uh, uh, documentation, the, the, the 30 random patient chart audit as um, a, an additional option um, if that's um, not available. Um, and those, uh, just to, to go through them since we've talked about them um, quite a bit, 
the different categories in that section are um, residing in the 10 zip codes that are most impacted by COVID um, of a racial or ethnic minority disproportionately impacted by COVID. So the African-American population and the Hispanic population um, experiencing healthcare um, challenges due to disability um, percent that have a, um, a language um, barrier um, or, or not English as a primary language. Um, and then the percent that are uninsured um, or uh, Medicaid eligible or, or Medicare, Medicaid dual eligible. And then the percent that are over 60 years old. Um, and then after that, um, there's just, again, some brief um, banking information and then attestations um, and that's the application. All right, wonderful. Um, so I see that we're coming to the end of our Q&A portion here. Um, so I'll go ahead and close the session to, um, to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, if you have follow-up questions or additional questions, um, send them to grants at primarycarecoalition.org um, or you can uh, go ahead and send us send me an email, reply to your uh, event confirmation, and I'm happy to relay those questions over. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. We will make this session available online via our YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for other educational content, including webinars on topics like telemedicine, remote patient monitoring, um, and 2021 ENM codes. As a reminder, MedKai does continue to coordinate all clinician calls with Dr. Howard Haft of the Maryland Department of Health on COVID-19. Those are every Wednesday at 5 p.m., except not this Wednesday, because we've got a holiday. Um, so to register for those, visit montgomerymedicine.org. Um, so I just wanna say thank you again to Susan Donovan from the Primary Care Coalition for joining us and for answering all of our many, many questions today. <laughs>